Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, stepping down another ballot shakeup in District 27 as Brendan Gill withdraws from the assembly race. His wife is back in. Let's dispel the notion of uh, backroom politics because, uh, you know, that uh, that is not the case here. Plus a presidential mugshot. Donald Trump is the first U.S. president to take an arrest photo and he's cashing in on it. Also, a cannabis doom loop. Critics slam the pace of New Jersey's cannabis marketplace rollout. The hurdles are there, the obstacles are definitely there. I think it's overly regulated. And shrinking the nursing shortage, William Patterson University launches a school of nursing. Very excited about where the school of nursing can take us to really leverage what we've built for even greater contribution to the state and the needs of the state. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Hello and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Joanna Gagas, in for Brianna Venozzi. Voters in District 27 have been scratching their heads at the ballot swap outs that have been happening in the last few weeks. First, longtime Senator and former Governor Dick Cody announced he'd step down after defeating Senator Nia Gill in a primary face-off. Then, Assembly candidate Alexin Colazos Gill, who won the primary in June, announced she was stepping away and would be replaced by her husband, Essex County Commissioner Brendan Gill only to then announce last night she's back in, he's out. I'm joined right now by Leroy Jones, chair of the Democratic State Committee, to help us understand this back-and-forth ballot shuffle. Chairman Jones, great to have you with us tonight. You know, what first looked like um, backroom politics really overriding the will of the people, have to, have to ask, now feels like a power grab between a husband and wife. What in the world is going on in District 27? So uh, let's dispel the notion of uh, backroom politics because, uh, you know, that uh, that is not the case here. You know, this was a, uh, you know, very transparent and open process. Uh, you know, it's a process that, uh, you know, was uh, was was uh, governed by statute and it was followed, uh, you know, by the letter of, of the law to the statute. OK, I'm going to push back on that because voters in District 27 voted in the primary for Senator Dick Cody. After he won that primary, ousting Nia Gill, he then stepped away. It essentially all but hands the, the nomination over to uh, Assemblyman John McKeon. Does that's, that... That's, uh, that's, that's, that's not quite accurate. So, um, so uh, what drove Senator Cody, uh, you know, to, uh, to take himself out of the election cycle... Uh, you know, that's between, uh, you know, Senator Cody and his family. Uh, but the reality of it was just that. And uh, by but statute, timing of that, but timing of that, Chairman, to happen after the primary, was this an attempt, an effort to oust Nia Gill, including the redistricting of the map that, that pitted them against each other? And now he stepped down right after the primary. It does assure that Assemblyman John McKeon will likely have that seat. So uh, redistricting was uh, settled uh, last year. Uh, the, uh, the election in the primary between Senator Cody and, and Senator Gill took place in June of this year. Uh, you know, Senator Cody won that election. Uh, we fast forward to, uh, to August and uh, Senator Cody, uh, you know, decided, and that's a question for Senator Cody, to, uh, to take himself out of uh, the election process. Uh, that created a vacancy. That vacancy uh, led the, uh, the county committee in the 27th legislative district, which is comprised of Essex County and Passaic County, to convene the members of the county committee as prescribed by statute. That was done. Senator McKeon was nominated. It was unanimous. And uh, and that concluded that process. 
certainly not what voters went to the polls voting for, but let's talk about the Gill situation. We have um, Brendan Gill stepping in after voters, um, after his wife won the primary. He says he's going to now run for the seat. Just a few days later, she says, hold on, I'm back in. I couldn't see any reason why I would step down. What is happening with the Gills? That is, uh, you know, a question that, uh, you know, is between, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Gill. It was a very transparent process. And, uh, you know, today we have a complete slate that's ready to go uh, to, to do battle in the general election of 2023. Chairman, there's a lot of criticism that it is the county leaders who end up deciding so much of what happens in the political sphere from the party line down here in New Jersey. And Democrats have consistently said that they are for increasing voters' rights. Does this process that just played out reflect that effort? Is this how elections should go in New Jersey? I've stated, uh, you know, on numerous occasions, the statute is uh, what we are governed by. If you were there, you would have saw, uh, you know, the transparency of that. You would have saw how democracy works, and you would have saw how vacancies are uh, filled. All right, Leroy Jones, chair of the Democratic State Committee here in New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. If a picture is worth a thousand words, well, this picture depicts the political moment of our lifetime. Former President Donald Trump's mugshot, taken last night when he was placed under arrest in Fulton County Jail in Georgia. The first time a United States president has ever had a mugshot taken. Donald Trump is already using it to raise significant money for his campaign. The photo splashed all over T-shirts, mugs, and other items being sold on his website. It's a stark depiction of the legal battle that's about to dominate America's awareness as the 2024 presidential election kicks into high gear. Last night, former President Trump was also given an inmate number and agreed to a $200,000 bond. He only had to pay 10 percent of that. Superior Court Judge Scott McAfee ruled this week that the case will begin on October 23rd of this year for the first co-defendant, Ken Chesaburo. But Trump's legal team has requested that his case be severed from the 18 other co-defendants. Fentanyl has led to a spike in overdose deaths, often because the user has no idea the drug they're taking is contaminated. A fatal amount of fentanyl can be the size of a pencil tip. So tackling the fentanyl crisis has led to some out-of-the-box thinking. One idea, providing test kits so drug users can see whether the drugs they're using are contaminated by fentanyl. Test strips are illegal in some states, but U.S. Senator Cory Booker and Congressman Josh Gottheimer are supporting legislation that would fund the kits to get them into the hands of those most at risk of a fentanyl overdose. When more than 109,000 Americans died last year from an opioid epidemic, folks here are not surrendering to that darkness, but saying we can show a different way. COVID is no longer dominating the news cycle, but there is a new strain that's dominating the new cases reported this summer called EG5, or ERIS. The strain is more transmissible than the last variant of the Omicron strain. Healthcare writer Lilo Stainton is here to lay out the latest in the COVID evolution. Lilo, great to talk with you. It has been a while since we checked in on the COVID numbers. Tell us what's going on out there in the world. Right. So no need to panic, but the numbers are definitely going up. We've heard about this for a while. We've seen numbers like 20 percent increase in hospitalizations nationwide in the last week. Um, in New Jersey, it, over the last sort of six weeks, um, hospitalizations have essentially doubled. Um, but that's from a really, really low point, like the lowest point ever. So um, it is important to keep in context that, you know, when we talk about, you know, these numbers going up, we're still talking, you know, in the hundreds. So uh, 300, 350 people may be hospitalized now with COVID, very small number. And the point is, even as infection numbers are going up even more, people point out that's not a real number because, you know, we're not capturing the, the home tests. But the truth is, you know, people aren't going to the hospital as much as they used to be. As your reporting delves into, really, it's uh, older senior citizens, those living in group homes and senior homes that are most vulnerable. What are the risks there right now um, as we see these hospitalizations increase? Yeah, I mean, those risks continue. And that's where a lot of people are focused on their, con you know, with their concern. 
where everybody is is encouraging that group to be sort of the first to get vaccinated, right? We have this new vaccine coming out in September, mid to late September. Um, you know, pharmacists expect older people to come first, um, that sort of more vulnerable group. Um, nursing homes are definitely still having outbreaks. Um, there were, I believe, nearly a thousand people, staff and residents who were uh, had tested positive sort of in the last week, which would have been at least a week old, the data. So, it, it, you know, it's hard to tell, but it is still circulating. That is for sure. Lilo, are we at the point with these outbreaks that it compares to other viruses and other outbreaks that we might see in a nursing home? Yes. And, you know, that go, sorry to go back to the vaccines, but again, this year you're likely to see and hear about sort of three options for vaccines that you can get in the fall or should get in the fall. The COVID vaccine, of course, which they have the new one coming out. Um, as well as the flu vaccine, which a lot of people get every year, especially in nursing homes and, you know, if, if you're in sort of a higher risk group. Um, and then there's RSV, which is available for also higher risk groups, and there's some infant options as well. And doctors want us to use these tools. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, we're just reporting on this. You're, you're not in a position necessarily to project, but um, from your reporting, does it look like there's going to be high demand, high push for this vaccine among average citizens, younger people? Not based on what I'm hearing. Um, I mean, I think there's a tremendous amount of confusion over who can get it still. You know, if it was, do you, do you have to have been boosted last year to get this? Do you need the orig original um, series? My understanding is no, everybody can get this new vaccine. It doesn't matter what your past history is, but please talk to your doctor. Pharmacists told me you know, that they will expect a certain number of people at the beginning, but it's nothing like we saw in the past. Lilo Stainton, healthcare writer, thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna. Back to school can be an exciting time for students and parents, but in Patterson, with just a little more than a week to go, the feeling's anything but hopeful. Late last month, a ceiling collapse at Public School 3 caused the district to close the school, and that's forcing kids into new, unfamiliar schools, in some cases, far from home. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan takes a look at the funding challenges that have led to crumbling schools and overcrowded classrooms in Patterson. We're less than two weeks away from the opening of school, and I mean, it's, it's a disaster. Corey Teague says school parents are panicky after Patterson's PS3 shut down late last month. A section of ceiling collapsed, scattering chunks of plaster and raising safety issues for incoming staff and 300-plus students at the K-8 through school. Teague, a former school board member, says kids from PS3 will now split up, attending three different schools in the district. Three different overly crowded schools. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, we already have overly crowded schools. It's like got 50 kids or 40 kids in the classroom. So where are they going to put them? By the time we, you know, narrowed it down, we were comfortable with the schools that we chose because we re were really looking to see which schools could accommodate those grade spans. Superintendent Lori Newell took this job in July. She says some kids will gather at PS3 to be bused across town to Martin Luther King Elementary. Others will attend a couple of local schools within walking distance. Workmen today delivered boxes to pack up supplies at PS3, where repairs will take four to five months and cost more than $2 million. Once the ceiling tile fell in, you know, then the asbestos issue is what but um, obviously rose to a great level of concern, but we're also very concerned about the structural integrity of the building overall. PS3 is one of 17 Patterson public schools built more than a century ago. The district's been trying to demolish this building since 1960 when a Columbia University report warned about asbestos. It's sad. You know, I shouldn't be able to see my school fall apart. Linda Rodriguez remembers attending PS3. She complained at a recent public meeting called to deal with the crisis. You guys should be able to do better to provide a better school for our students. It's 124 years old. We were slated to fix two classrooms this summer and also put in a, uh, a bathroom in that school. Um, we didn't expect um, on the first floor that the ceilings would fall. Neglect is not 
what it is. It's just age and the systems reaching their useful life. The district's uh, facilities York, manager uh, says they've spent nearly a half million dollars making repairs at PS3 over the past three years. The district keeps pouring money into patching up old schools. With funding from New Jersey Schools Development Authority, Patterson built two new ones in 2016 and is listed for a new high school, but nine other substandard schools, including PS3, linger on Patterson's replacement list. If we valued Patterson's children and children in the other poorest communities in New Jersey, they would have been funded. We would have given them adequate facilities a long time ago. The district wants more state funding to keep up with repairs and build new schools, but to bring PS3 up to modern educational standards requires expansion, more than double its current square footage. The Main Street lot's too small. We really have to sit down and make a lot of really hard decisions about what we're going to do with School 3. The public will gather again for another hearing on the issue scheduled for August 29th at PS2. In Patterson, I'm Brenda Flanagan, and J Spotlight News. Legalizing cannabis was supposed to boost state revenue while also righting the wrongs of the war on drugs, but more than a year into its launch, advocates call the rollout a doom loop, blaming licensing delays and mismanagement by the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Ted Goldberg spoke to the group behind the new report about why they're worried for New Jersey's marijuana industry. This is actually a medication that can be given and no harm, no overdosing, no death from marijuana. So I think it was a natural fit to go to a better medication. Better medication persuaded Ramez Maximus to stop working in pharmacies and open up Urban, Newark's first dispensary selling recreational cannabis. It took about three and a half years to go from submitting an application to getting a license to sell medical, and then another four months until he could sell recreational. I mean, we could open a pharmacy in three to six months, but a cannabis business takes three to four years to get open. It's, it, the, the hurdles are there, the obstacles are definitely there. I think it's overly regulated, but you know, I understand that this is a brand new market and, you know, everybody wants to make sure that we do it the right way and I support that, but I think it's definitely too hard. Urban has been selling recreational cannabis for a week now. And while Maximus says business has been solid, it cost $100,000 to add on recreational. It's all of our life savings, it's loans, lines of credits on our properties. It was a lot, a lot of money, but uh, we try to stay self-funded so we can keep uh, the decision making in-house. Those entrepreneurs have spent anywhere between a million for uh, a million to three million for dispensaries and anywhere from three to 40 million for cultivations. And, and uh, many times by the time those facilities are finished, these entrepreneurs are at the end of their financial rope. Todd Johnson leads the New Jersey Cannabis Trade Association, or the CTA, and he says it's too difficult for New Jersey's dispensary owners to get in the game, especially compared to other states who are also legalizing cannabis sales. New Jersey was expected to be stronger than Missouri and Maryland. We were expected to have a billion dollar plus market right out of the gate, whereas in our first full year of of, um, of cannabis, of legal adult use cannabis sales, I don't even think we topped 800 million. The CTA released a report this week chastising New Jersey for creating what it calls a doom loop, blaming the bureaucracy at the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, or the CRC, for disappointing cannabis sales. This year, New Jersey is projected to earn $38 million in cannabis taxes, slightly less than Montana, with a population of around a million people, and much less than Oregon, which has less than half of New Jersey's population. According to the CTA report, New Jersey earned $20 million in tax revenue in the first nine months of recreational sales. We need to remove the obstacles in the beginning so you can get to the real ones like municipality support and raising capital. Part of the equation is also New Jersey's tax rate on cannabis. Surprisingly, it's much lower than what Montana and Oregon are charging. Others in the cannabis industry agree that it's a process to open a dispensary in the Garden State, but they don't put all the blame on the CRC. I can't access traditional banking per se. How do I raise money for my cultivation facility or my retail operation? How do I do that? Shirali Patel is the founder of the law firm Blaze Responsibly. She strongly disagrees with the CTA's report and says the larger issue is municipalities making approvals overly complicated. Investors are following the news, they follow the trends and they see the headlines. And when the headline says, hey, this is a doom loop, 
we're money isn't going to come into our state. Um, they issued a bunch of approvals for applicants at, in Red Bank last year. Um, then a few months ago, uh, they decided to change their the rules, change their process. As of today, New Jersey has 39 recreational dispensaries. The CRC has its next meeting two weeks from today, so we could see more dispensaries across the state soon. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. In our Spotlight on Business report tonight, a new charge against Medieval Times this week claims the dinner and tournament company violated workers' rights in its efforts to stop them from unionizing. The charges brought by the National Labor Relations Board cite examples of Medieval Times withholding raises for employees who had unionized, illegally firing a union supporter, and shutting down the TikTok account of the union group Medieval Times Performers United. The Lyndhurst location unionized last year the first of the nine castles to do so, demanding higher wages and better safety at a job they say can be extremely dangerous. Workers at the California location have been on strike since February. And here's a look at how the markets rebounded to end the week. Support for the Business Report provided by the Chamber of Commerce Southern New Jersey, working for economic prosperity by uniting business and community leaders for 150 years. Membership and event information online at chambersnj.com. New Jersey's nursing shortage has led to understaffing in hospitals, even contributing to an ongoing nurses' strike. It's nothing new. Nurse numbers have been on the decline for years, made worse by COVID. While well, one school is tackling the issue head on, creating the William Patterson University School of Nursing. Joshua Powers, provost and senior vice president of academic affairs, joined me to talk about it. Josh, so great to have you on the show. Now, you were really the driving force behind the creation of uh, the William Patterson School of Nursing. We know there's a teaching, excuse me, there's a nursing shortage in New Jersey, in the nation. How much did that shortage factor into the creation of this program? Well, thank you very much for having me to be able to talk about this important topic. Um, that nursing shortage was one of our primary reasons for, for doing this. Right now, the estimates are there are around 13,000 unfilled nursing positions around the state. Um, and we see tremendous opportunity and need to address that particular challenge. Um, we now have probably one of the largest nursing programs in the state, both at the undergraduate and graduate level. And we're just very excited about where the School of Nursing can take us to really leverage what we've built for even greater contribution to the state and the needs of the state. Let's talk about the program just a little bit. Tell us what the students who come through your doors are going to walk away with, whether it's a graduate or undergraduate degree. Sure, well, there's a couple of things that are important to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, one of the ways we've built our ex the tremendous expansion has been on uh, through our WP Online. So we launched a series of programs actually right at the start of the pandemic. Um, and those have grown uh, extraordinarily because they meet the needs of working professionals. So that particular component, which is also an affordable way to pursue a nursing education, has just been an extraordinarily game changer for us. And the School of Nursing and the partnerships we've developed around it are going to be able to allow us to leverage that some more, particularly in perhaps some of the allied health professions. Yeah, it's interesting because you could have made this just a nursing major, a nursing degree, but instead you dedicated a school to it and you leaned on uh, insight and, and expertise from some of New Jersey's hospital systems. Just talk about that process and, and what you gained from those conversations to better prepare these young professionals. Sure. Well, as uh, uh, anybody in the nursing area recognizes, the partnerships with area health providers is critical in part because of the need for clinical sites where students can go have an opportunity to learn with, with in, in the hospital and all the things that go along with that. So we have very strong relationships, for example, right here in Wayne with St. Joseph's uh, Hospital System. It's been an incredible, incredible partner with us. Atlantic Health Systems has been another partner with us. They have a huge need for nurses 
and we have a need to engage them for the uh, around some teaching opportunities in our curriculum to be able to allow that to expand and the school of nursing and the framework of that with our new leader will allow us to do that and just very quickly do you anticipate that this program is going to help solve or at least majorly reduce the nursing shortage that we see uh, I, I'm not under the illusion it will solve the nursing shortage, but William Patterson is, I, I think we found the key things that make that possible. Yeah. Our biggest need is faculty. There's a faculty problem. We don't have enough faculty to deliver our programs. Um, but if we partner with the, with the health systems and allow nurses to be on our faculty, which is something we've worked very actively to do, and our school of nursing will help us do even more, that's a key way to get the capacity to be able to do some of that. That's all the time we have, but Josh Powers from William Patterson University, thank you so much. You're totally welcome, I appreciate it. That's gonna do it for us tonight, but don't forget to download the NJ Spotlight News podcast so you can listen to us anytime. I'm Joanna Gagas for all of us here at NJ Spotlight News. Thanks for being with us, have a great weekend, and we'll see you back here on Monday. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.